So very briefly, uh, Françoise Vergès is a political theorist, feminist. Mm -hmm. Her most recent publication is Un féminisme décolonisé uh, with La Fabrique uh, this year, 2019. Brent Hayes Edwards is professor in, of the English and Comparative Literature Department at Columbia. His books include The Practice of Diaspora, Epistrophie, Jazz and the Literary Imagination, and the recent translation of Michel Leris's Phantom Africa. Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak is university professor at Columbia University. Her field of interest is English, French, and German literature and literary theory studied historically from a post-colonial feminist perspective. Um, before I, I hand over to Brent, I have uh, another message. This message is not from a writer, it's from Columbia. So it's from specifically President Lee Bollinger who says to Marise, or to everyone, it is an honor to celebrate Marise Condé and her lifetime of remarkable work. With an eye for the magic of literature and her skill at conveying the beauty and brutality of life, she has subverted convention and given voice to the overlooked, creating unforgettable characters and stories that transcend time and place. At Columbia, where she taught for a decade, Professor Condé reframed our approach to French and Francophone literature and made an indelible mark with the force of her intellect and her extraordinary generosity. So um, with that, I will hand over to Brent. Good evening. Bonsoir. <laughs> uh, je vais un peu sauter entre l'anglais et le français. Um, I'm going to be relatively informal, and I'm also, like uh, Lydi earlier, going to divulge a secret that may be even more humiliating than a bémoin. <laughs> um, I, I guess you might say that I'm sort of in an in-between generation in an odd way, which I hadn't really thought about until uh, today, in that I went to graduate school, I did my doctoral degree at Columbia, and now I teach at Columbia, but Marisa and I intersected only partially. I was done with coursework before she got there, so I wasn't her student in the classroom. Um, and then she had taken emeritus status uh, and stopped teaching by the time I left Rutgers and took a job at Columbia, so I sort of missed her as a colleague, too. I did have some chances to interact with her at events at Columbia, um, and I certainly got to know uh, Richard and Marise over the years. One memorable one that I will only give you the slightest uh, flavor of was a panel that I believe I should blame Gayatri for. Gayatri asked me to moderate, I was still teaching at Rutgers, but living in the area, and she asked me to moderate a panel uh, putting Marise and Richard in conversation, which I, I think Gayatri titled this. <laughs> it was called Intimate Enemies, a writer <laughs> and her translator. <laughs> It was a memorable occasion. What I, what I remember is the first thing that Marie's Conte said. Uh, I introduced them and asked them to give a brief statement before I tried to put them in dialogue. And the first two things Marie said were, I resent being forced to have this conversation in English. <laughs> and then she said, I want to say one thing about translation. All translation is a form of rape. I was trying not to look at Richard. Uh, <laughs> and that was the beginning of our conversation. I will not tell you about uh, that, that event this evening. Um, I do want to take you into the, what Kayama called a while ago the intimité, the intimacy of Marise's pedagogy um, from a few different angles that I've experienced it. And so I will be a little bit personal if, if you'll indulge me. Um, I wanted to talk just about a couple of things that I've learned from Marise Condé that she might not even know that I've learned from her. And I mean both from her fiction but also from her literary criticism. And by her fiction I also mean the theoretical insights that are staged in her novels. In terms of the literary criticism, one thing that we forget, and I don't think it's been mentioned today, is how important her criticism is. Um, between Eremakonon, between 1976 and Une saison Ariata in 1981, 
um, and Segu in the 80s, between those novels that come out the next decade, she writes an enormous body of critical work, of literary critical, rather traditional, rather conventional literary critical readings of texts, including a great study of Aimé Césaire, um, of the Cahier, a wonderful book called La Civilisation du Beau Salle, a Réflexion sur la littérature orale de la Guadeloupe et la Martinique, and one that was very important to me called La Parole, la Parole des Femmes, Essay sur la, les Romancières des Antilles de Langue Française, in 1979. So I'm going to try to talk between the criticism more directly than we've heard today and the critical lessons that I've learned from a, a little bit of the fiction. Um, but the secret that I want to divulge, the Gayatri is the only other person in the room who was there, I want to tell you a story from my dissertation defense. Because the one way that I was Marisa's student is she was one of the outside readers on my dissertation defense. And it also was a memorable occasion. I, in one of the chapters of my dissertation that then became my book, The Practice of Diaspora, I write a great deal about the career of Paulette Nardal um, and her sisters, especially Jane Nardal, um, as pivotal figures in the pre-negritude intellectual circuits that animated Paris in the late 20s and into the 1930s. And I'd written in that chapter, I'll read you, uh, as I said, more humiliating than a B minus. I'll read you a little bit of my dissertation, um, two sentences. I had written, it is generally agreed that Nardal's article, Le Vé de la Conscience de Race, from La Revue du Monde Noir in 1931, is the single most significant work to be published in La Revue du Monde Noir. What interests me, I said, is the way this developing diasporic consciousness is linked for Nardal to a kind of feminism manqué, to certain ideas about Caribbean men and women in the metropole. When it got to Marise's turn in my defense, this is the first thing she said, as I recall it, I want to know why you call Paulette Nardal a feminist manqué. <laughs> uh, those of us who are in the academy, in whatever capacity, know that there's a certain, you could call it the generosity of the long-winded question, <laughs> where you take some time to spin out the question, and it's generous because you give a person a time to come up with a response. This was not one of those questions. That's all she said. Uh, I stumbled around the room, and unfortunately, Gayatri Spivak was also in the room, so it became an important theme in my dissertation defense. Uh, I don't mean to scare any of the students in the room. Uh, but it also became enabling. I went back to La Parole des Femmes, which had been a book I had used in my dissertation. It was Marisa's criticism that introduced me to the fiction of Suzanne Lacascade, um, Claire Solange, I'm African, and I went back to La Parole des Femmes to think about the way Marie's operated as a critic and as a feminist critic. Uh, with Claire Solange, if you know that novel, relatively obscure um, but very interesting novel from the mid-1920s uh, that had not been written about really at all until Marie's wrote about it. Even when I was writing about it, it almost had not been touched. Marie's is very critical of Claire Solange, of the character um, and the character's self-conceptualization in relation to race. Um, Claire Solange, his character, is an Antillian who comes to the metropole and who professes and kind of performs a, a certain hyperbolic Africanness, a kind of Afrocentrism avant la lettre. And Marise, in her writing about it in La Parole des Femmes, is critical. She says, En croyant refuser l'assimilation, elle, Claire Solange, this character, s'ingénie à se faire accepter du Mont Blanc par la prise de position d'éléments venus en droite ligne de la mythologie raciste. So she ex accepts the stereotypes, um, what Gayatri told me to, to think of as a legitimation by reversal. You just turn it over, but you're not overturning or undoing the opposition. But then there's a patience in the way Marise writes about this novel that I had to learn how to learn from. She goes on to say, Gardons-nous cependant de critiquer Claire Solange, qui tente de s'affirmer comme distincte et de se valoriser dans sa personnalité d'antillaise, même si un tel effort nous paraît ambigu. In general, in this book, reading uh, the work of Simone Schwartzbart, of Mayotte Capesia, of La Cascade, of Marie Vieux Chauvet, uh, of La Crocille, Michel La Crocille, of these pioneering um, Antillean women writers, there's an amazing feminist patience that I felt going back to it after 
having survived my dissertation defense, I had to learn. She says in the end, uh, la protestation, on peut même dire la contestation, qu'elle, these authors, véhicule cependant, est plus nuancée. And you have to learn to read feminism in relation to that nuance. So I went back, and if, if uh, you'll indulge me reading the revised paragraph, I totally changed the chapter. And the chapter, that particular moment in the chapter, what I say there is, what would it mean to theorize a feminist articulation of diaspora? Um, about Eve de la conscience de race, uh, I say that her evocation is an, of an emergent black cultural internationalism is linked to an equally nascent feminism. And I think that what I at least tried to do is make an argument that the emergence of Nardal's feminist sensibility actually precedes and leads to the formulation of her black internationalist consciousness. It's because she's a feminist, it's because of her experience as a black woman in the metropole and the feminism that emerges out of that experience that she starts to think towards internationalist solidarity. It's not that Marise gave me this argument, but it's that her prodding, her scolding, <laughs> you might call it a, a pédagogy de grandation, de <laughs> grandateur, <laughs> parfois il faut un peu de être un peu grandé, uh, get yourself together. It's scolding that got me to a place where I had to figure it out for myself. And the other thing that I wanted to, to point to that I, th I think I've learned from Marisa's work and it was implicit in that question around the transatlantic trajectory in so many of her works, um, which we could talk about, I think, a great, much greater length. But what I wanted to put pressure on is a term that uh, is in the title of my first book and a term that I, that I've tried to think through for a long time now, the term diaspora. You could say that even if, uh, as it was said earlier, Marie Condé is the conscience du monde noir, uh, there's a certain skepticism in her work, at least that I read in her work, in relation to diaspora as a term and as a project. Diaspora understood as or defined as an idealization of racial ancestry or a presumption of commonality. Uh, in one of her critical essays from the 70s and 80s, um, she talks about, she takes a rather jaundiced view of the compulsion of blacks in the new world to return to what she calls la matrice noire qui était l'Afrique, um, the black womb that Africa came to represent. She asks rhetorically in that essay, uh, this is an essay called Notes, Notes sur, un pays, sur un retour au pays natal. Uh, she asks rhetorically, Finalement, est-ce que l'Afrique existe ailleurs que dans la tête des, des non-Africains D'autre part, dans celle des gens de la diaspora Does Africa exist anywhere else but in the heads of non-Africans and anywhere else but in the heads of the peoples of the diaspora So there's a certain kind of critique or skepticism in relation to the purported project of the idealization of diaspora. In the avant-propos, in the, the preface to the 1988 republication of Vera Macononne under the title En attendant le bonheur, Condé writes that Veronica's disastrous sentimental entanglements with a comprador politician in the post colony serve to, this is her summary of the novel looking back at it a decade later, she says that the mess of Veronica's relationship with her uh, negre <laughs> avec Ayeu matérialise la distance aujourd'hui connue, mesurée entre l'Afrique et ce qu'il est convenu d'appeler ces diasporas, et éclaire l'absurdité qu'il y a à parler en plein XXe siècle de monde noir. So the material, the mess of this novel, this, this love affair, materializes the distance known today and measured between Africa and what it's conventional to call its diasporas and make clear the absurdity that there is in speaking in the middle of the 20th century of a black world. But the novel shadows this farce of Veronica's relationship with her comprador politician with another subtler, more fleeting, and more enigmatic series of not quite meetings between two radically differently paced place persons of African descent, this time in Paris. And this is the part of Ere Makonon that I always go back to. Um, it's, a, it's something that I find very productive, although it's very small. It's a very small portion in the novel. While in Africa, Veronica periodically remembers and wonders about the African balayeur, the street sweeper, whom she used to see in Paris working on the Rue de l'Université over near the Sorbonne. Um, in one interview with Ina Césaire, she says to Césaire that the street sweeper is, 
even if he just shows up in two or three scenes in the novel, she says he's a personage essentiel. Condé says, c'est la représentation symbolique de l'Afrique humiliée de nos jours encore. And that's important, but I actually find it productive to think about it not so much from the symbolic angle, um, but instead from another angle. This is another quote from another uh, interview Maurice gave a few years later. She says, what interests me in general is cultural encounters and the conflicts and changes that come from them. And I think this fleeting, not quite meeting, sharing shared gaze across the street as Veronica is walking um, next to the Sorbonne, this, what, it, what it proposes in terms of encounters is something I find very pr uh, productive to think through. In the novel, the street sweeper looks at her and her white French lover as they pass by. She doesn't ever, ever speak to him, but she's obsessed with his gaze. Not because it's judgmental, but precisely because it's not. Pas de mépris dans son regard, et c'est pourtant celui qui me hante, qui me hante. So there's no contempt in his look, and that's what I can't get out of my mind. The novel ends with Veronica returning to Paris and wondering not about her family, not about her boyfriend, not about her friends, but about the street sweeper. That's the first thing she's thinking about. Comment salua, salua, salura t il mon retour? How will he welcome me back, she wonders. Un jour, il faudra romp, romper ce silence. Il faudra que je lui explique quoi? Cette erreur, cette tragique erreur que je ne pouvais pas ne pas commettre, étant ce que je suis. Je me suis trompé, trompé d'ailleurs. Voilà tout. J'ai cherché mon salut là où il ne le fallait pas. One day I'll have to break the silence, I'll have to explain it to him. What? This mistake, this tragic mistake I couldn't help making, being what I am. I was wrong, I got my ancestors wrong, that's all. I look for myself right where I shouldn't have. This is on the last page of the novel. There's a subtlety in the last sentence in the French original that I looked for myself doesn't quite capture. The French, j'ai cherché mon salut, là où il ne le fallait pas, is both more exalted and more mundane. On the one hand, salut is the term for salvation in the religious sense, but the phrasing also echoes the welcome she expects from the street sweeper. Comment salura-t-il mon retour? In a manner that suggests not only acknowledgement, but also the familiar greeting. Salut, hey, hi. I look for my salvation right where one shouldn't look. The only thing that saves us is the one word that brings us together, that breaks the silence not with an unearned presumption of solidarity, but with something simpler, encounter, recognition, the beginning of dialogue. Je me suis trompé d'ailleurs. I got the wrong ancestor. Perhaps it might be said that Ere Makonon tempts us to se tromper de diaspora, too. But it also suggests in ambiguity, in anticipation, in the margins, the ways we need to learn to read diaspora elsewhere and otherwise. Congratulations and thank you. Bonsoir, euh, merci Kayama et Madeleine pour avoir organisé et merci à Marise d'être là et à tous les amis euh, que Marise euh, fait chaque fois se retrouver. Alors euh, je n'ai pas été une étudiante de Marise ni une collègue de Marise donc c'est un, un, enfin, un peu étrange de commencer parce qu'elle me dit mais je suis un imposteur mais bon je vais essayer de quand même euh, de parler. Donc je me placerai moi en dehors de l'université euh, J'ai connu Marise en dehors de l'université et je suis restée son amie depuis. Euh, euh, L'annonce est une écrivaine pour notre temps. Alors je me demandais quel est ce temps dont on parle. Euh, il y a, euh, on, voit, on le voit tous les jours à lire les journaux, un effort de la part des puissants pour que leur passé, c'est-à-dire leur passé d'esclavage, de dépossession, de colonialisme, de racisme, soit notre présent. C'est-à-dire que nous ne soit jamais passé, que nous soit encore dans notre vie aujourd'hui. Un temps de division qui, dé, qui dresse chacun et chacune contre l'autre. Face à cet assaut, à cette division de l'humanité entre les vies qui comptent et les vies qui ne comptent pas, une vieille, très vieille et ancienne division, Marise offre une alternative que je trouve fondamentale. Elle offre l'amitié, elle offre l'amour, jamais de manière niaise, certainement pas de la part de Marise, mais profonde, réelle et exigeante. L'amitié que Marise, que toi tu nous offres, 
et profondément réconfortante. Tu as le talent, partout où tu t'installes, de créer un réseau d'amis, de les rassembler autour d'une table dont tu as cuisiné les mets. Cette amitié fidèle, que tu sais constante, est à mes yeux un bien précieux pour notre temps. Dans ces temps de guerre permanente, tu nous offres quelque chose qui serait de la paix, du paisible. Pas la paix, de nouveau, qui serait cet entretemps de la guerre, mais ce moment paisible où on peut se retrouver et parler simplement. Tu es aussi d'une très grande curiosité, qui est une qualité que j'apprécie par-dessus tout, et à laquelle j'accorde aussi une grande importance. Cette curiosité qui questionne toutes les formes de naturalisation, qui transforme l'injustice en justice, l'inégalité en égalité, le racisme en différence radicale, qui fait de l'autre un ennemi. La deuxième chose aussi que je partage peut-être avec toi, Marise, et dont je voudrais parler ce soir, c'est ce qu'on appelle en français les Outre-mer. Pour toi la Guadeloupe, pour moi la Réunion, mais je vois aussi la Guyane ici et la Martinique. Xavier Luce remarquait combien les romans et les récits de Marise débusquent, explorent les coins et les recoins de ces terres dont on parle souvent et qu'on connaît si mal. En arrivant d'ailleurs à la Guadeloupe en décembre dernier, Marise, tu as dit « Je suis heureuse, simplement, bêtement, naïvement, et aussi fière d'abord pour la Guadeloupe. C'est pour elle que j'ai travaillé, c'est pour elle que je suis récompensée. » Tu as parlé euh, ailleurs, d'ailleurs, de la relation, pourtant très souvent, de compliquée à ton île natale. Ta critique de la petite bourgeoisie noire qui voulait s'élever. Tu dis d'ailleurs dans ton portrait filmé, euh, Marie Scondé, une voix singulière, que pour tes parents, ni les noirs, ni les mulattes, ni les blancs n'étaient assez bien. Et donc, il ne fallait fréquenter personne. <rire> C'est une critique que tu partages d'ailleurs avec Aimé Césaire qui va s'écrier quand il part pour la France « Enfin, je serai libre » et qui pourtant reviendra en Martinique et finira sa vie. Critique aussi que tu partages avec Franz Fanon qui a analysé le désir aliénant de reconnaissance de l'être humain noir pour porter un masque blanc. Tu as toujours affirmé que tu étais fanonienne et cette reconnaissance, tu n'en veux pas. Aussi, ainsi, dans une interview pour l'émission de Daniel Picouli, page 19, tu lui réponds que quand il te demande si tu vas répondre positivement à l'invitation de l'actuel président de la République française, qui t'avait envoyé une lettre de félicitations en t'invitant dans sa demeure à une re rencontre, tu lui réponds que non, car ce prix va à la Guadeloupe et non pas à une écrivaine française. Tu soulignes cependant le manque de reconnaissance de la France, ce qui a conduit d'ailleurs à des malentendus lors du débat qui a suivi l'émission en question, hein, où, auquel j'assistais, débat auquel j'assistais. En, en effet, certains dans le public ont compris que tu étais à la recherche d'une reconnaissance, d'une reconnaissance par la France, et sont intervenus pour insister alors sur cette reconnaissance en utilisant le discours suivant. La France doit reconnaître la richesse qu'on leur apporte, nous, les issues de la diversité. On leur apporte, c'est nous qui la rendons riche. Or, c'est là n'était pas du tout à mes yeux ta position. Et je me suis permis d'interrompre l'émission, enfin la, la, la conversation, et de rappeler que tu t'affirmais toujours guadeloupéenne et que tu avais dit, et que tu continuais à dire, que tu étais une indépendantiste. Donc cette question de la, de la reconnaissance, évidemment, tu ne la comprenais pas dans ce sens. Et pour moi, cette question de la reconnaissance est aussi une question pour notre temps. On connaît la longue lutte pour la reconnaissance, mais dans cette lutte, il y a plusieurs aspects. Celle qui demande à en être à être amie, à être admise, même si c'est dans un coin, même si c'est à la cuisine, pendant que les autres sont au salon. Celle qui, et puis, celles qui jouent sur les frontières entre demande et refuse, sont pour moi, donc, et, et refus de cette reconnaissance. Fanon, on s'en souvient, appelé à quitter cette Europe, qui n'en finit pas de parler de l'homme, tout en le massacrant partout où elle le rencontre. Ce n'est pas nécessairement ce que tu fais, mais tu signales que tu ne seras pas soumise à la logique de la reconnaissance telle qu'elle est normée en Europe. Et la question de la reconnaissance ne se pose sans doute pas de la même manière, on pourrait dire, pour les femmes. Je pense d'ailleurs à ce projet que nous avions, mais je crois que Lydie, tu en faisais partie, les filles de Caliban, quand on avait écrit « Daughters of Caliban », c'est-à-dire quand il y avait toutes ces rediscussions sur la pièce de Shakespeare de la tempête et de Caliban comme personnage principal, et que de nouveau c'était encore Caliban, et qu'on avait dit « ben non, nous serons les filles de Caliban », justement, et qu'il y avait quand même des femmes dans cette histoire, et qu'on avait, je crois qu'il y a eu un livre d'ailleurs qu'on a publié, donc j'en reviens à ces Outre-mer, à ces territoires qui ont connu esclavage, colonialisme et depuis 1946, ce que j'appellerais une colonialité républicaine. Des terres ravagées par les inégalités et qui ne cessent de résister, soit en se révoltant, en manifestant, soit aussi en inventant de plus en plus des pratiques de fugitivité, de construction d'espaces autonomes, particulièrement dans, sur ces îles. 
de repartir, de marronner, dirions-nous, pour revenir effectivement pour construire des pratiques de soins, de soi, dans un monde où la dépendance imposée par l'État français contraint, entrave et restreint. Fugitivité pour refuser l'injonction à être reconnue par le maître, se détourner de cette loi qui enchaîne, à qui, en fait, nie votre existence. Dès lors, ta position têtue pour l'indépendance de la Guadeloupe est une position pour notre temps, celle de briser les chaînes de la dépendance, de questionner la naturalisation des liens, des liens qui existeraient entre la France et ce qu'on appelle encore les Outre-mer. Dans sa leçon inaugura, euh, Lid, euh, pardon, Lydie, tu parlais de la pertinence de Marise et cette pertinence qui m'est chère, elle est évidemment ce qu'on appelle à ce liber, cette liberté de ton qui la protège aussi donc de cette de désir, de cette injonction à la reconnaissance et qui la protège aussi, je pense, d'un autre, d'une autre danger, d'une autre menace, qui est une menace en fait aussi bien française, bien assimilatrice, de la panthénisation qui serait la pacification de ta parole. Pour notre temps, car Marise, tu refuses cette pacification. Tu questionnes toujours ce qui vient s'établir comme norme, comme ordre, ordre qui étouffe et qui réprime. En moment aujourd'hui où se pose de nouveau plus fermement et plus peut-être de manière plus forte que ces dernières années, les questions qu'on appelle coloniales, de l'histoire coloniale et les questions raciales en France, cette stratégie de la pacification est une stratégie qui, de nouveau, va réprimer, faire taire, effacer. Et ta parole, justement, nous demande, tes livres, nous encourage à refuser cette pacification. Dans sa leçon inaugurale au Collège de France pour la chaire des mondes francophones, l'écrivaine Yannick Lahens disait « la littérature commence là où la parole devient impossible. La parole de colo- décoloniale a bien du mal à être entendue en France. La parole de l'indépendance aussi, comme force d'existence, non pas comme imitation de l'État-nation, comme nationaliste étroit à établir, mais comme recherche de soi sans phare. Merci, Maris. Is the mic picking me up? Okay, fine. Maurice Condé does not need a prize to be a hero of our time because I believe that I would say with Madeleine, Swedish Academy, are you listening? And my uh, own title, in fact, I've taken your title very literally, a writer for our times now, And therefore, my title is Maurice Condé, writer, peacemaker, in the sense in which you, Françoise, uh, spoke, and also Ronnie Scharfman, and the general idea of the therapy. I want to take the psychoanalytic metaphor away, but how one can, in fact, use. I am an activist. I use literature. I'm a teacher. I don't write. So therefore, I have taken my idea in that way for my few words. Maurice, Richard, and I were neighbors for a little while. I was in 454. You folks, I believe, were in 456. I went Riverside Drive. I went to see them, but not as often as you would imagine. And it is for the first time now, today, that I am confessing why because I was in awe of Marie Scandé, the kind of sense, am I worthy? Now, you will believe that this particular sense does not come to me very often. <laughs> but <laughs> but that's, that's, that's why, Marie, now you know. <laughs> okay, so the, um, also, I will speak a little bit of the, what Brent Uh, said about Erima Conan, especially, you know, that last thing, the class thing that you said, I believe that in fact that moment, as it were, of transgression, rather than learning, because there is no response that Maris represents. She doesn't, resp- uh, she doesn't represent that. And there, in fact, I try to inhabit that last moment in order to draw a reading which is really for our times. 
In the early 80s, I asked my very dear friend Clarisse Zimra what feminist text I could put on my syllabus that would grasp the situation of Africa. That, those were the words I asked. She said, without hesitation, Erema Conan. I had not yet met Marie Scondé. I was gobsmacked by the book because it is not recognizably identitarian, you know, intimacy and identity, and Marie says, people want me to judge me on identity, and therefore, dot, dot, I'm quoting uh, an interview, uh, uh, because it is not recognizably identitarian, it did not, because it was critical, it did not receive the absolute appreciation that it deserved immediately. She became famous with the second book, but today, today, our time, when all over the world, so that uh, to an extent I'm taking that 1988 introduction and Brent's comment on it further into our time, when all over the world identity politics is destroying democracy in tremendously heterogeneous and diversified ways, to recognize with constructive sympathy as does Maurice, that the most vulnerable yet class powerful innocent subject of identitarianism, namely someone like Veronique, you know, looking for niggers with ancestors, innocent subject of identitarianism is the narcissism of the well-placed diasporic female, strictly to be distinguished from the underclass migrants culturalist representation of the inaccessibility to class mobility often gender comprom compromised, strictly to be distinguished from those black lives that really do not matter, for which one has to say black lives matter, not just identifying because one is black, and also strictly to distinguish from something like Charlottesville. But this distinction is not kept in mind. And the, in the end of that book, Erema Conon, Maurice invites us readers to inhabit that and turn. The, so today, the middle to upper middle class diasporics condition and effect of identity politics, and I know this also as Indian, in living in, the, uh, in uh, New York with an Indian passport, as young Indians, Columbia University, brand name university, asked me to speak to them on voting week because they expect to, dis uh, to disturb democracy by voting blocks, claiming that they are minorities. The, today, the middle to upper middle class diasporics condition and effect of identity politics choose to ignore the, these distinctions and celebrates the unexamined culturalism that also ignores the fact that their place of origin has a separate class gendered modernity. In the metropolitan space of their citizenship, this divisive culturalism compromises the austere abstractions of democracy that inhabit the performative contradiction between autonomy on myself and equality for others who do not resemble me. In terms of the place of origin, the diaspora's attitude becomes primary. This problem played out in the Caribbean in a different formation. Today, the most peculiar African-American expression of this is Afro-pessimism. Fanon gives an ungendered version of this problematic when it was just about to take shape, I quote. It can be affirmed that in the West Indies in 1939, no spontaneous claim of negritude rang forth. It was then that three events occurred, Fanon writes, successively. The first event was the arrival of Césaire. For the first time, Fanon writes, with a very well-known passage, a lycée teacher, a man, therefore, who was apparently worthy of respect, was seen to announce quite simply to West Indian society that it is fine and good to be a Negro. To be sure, this created a scandal. It was said at the time that he was a little mad, and his colleagues went out of their way to give details as to his supposed ailment. What indeed could be more grotesque than an educated man, a man with a diploma, having in consequence understood a good many things, among other, others that it was unfortunate to be a Negro, proclaiming that his skin was beautiful and that the big black hole was a source of truth. Marie's uh, comments on our friend Gaz Phillips that 
He thought of himself as a European, most of them, and Kaz, on the other hand, uh, Carol Phillips, uh, on the other hand, in his book, Cambridge, claims the right to plagiarize, because of course, black writers are accused of plagiarizing from the white, the fantastic, fantastic kind of claim. Anyway, so Condé's book gave us, Erema Conon, a reversal of this, perhaps a cleaner man, an amazing prefiguration of what has become a global problem today with constructive sympathy. For all medicine turns to poison unless the, ch uh, the changing dosage determination is caught constantly. This is why these kinds of, you can't just say, ah, Fanon said this about Césaire, and then forget about the end of Enema Conon. All medicine changes to poison when it's claimed through an ignoring of class. So unless the changing dosage is constantly determined, we teachers speak in this way. I don't write novels, I teach them. So let us go global. The linguistic diversity of the subaltern is a tremendous problem for the development lobby today. While the United Nations and many, many academic institutions are busy preserving, the development lobby finds the subaltern wealth of languages an impediment. Since the wealthy capitalists who develop, which is of course a, a, a strange word, which if I, if I was speaking longer, I would share with you the real meaning of that word, sustainable underdevelopment. Those, the wealthy capitalists who quote develop are usually monolingual. Again, Condé gives us a prefiguration in her slight hero, Veronica, and I can read this as a moment of sympathetic transgression through which the problem can begin to fester. I quoted a piece from the novel in an article I wrote for Lidi Mudileno. The idea is not that you do good. The idea is that you read better. You rehearse the text as you're reading a book like Erima Conon, uh, uh, indeed any book. In that sense, reading is like writing, and in the broadest possible sense, reading as writing. It is an allegory of knowing and doing. An undisclosed West African subaltern speaker, possibly feminine, says to the French-speaking upper-class Veronica, who will later compliment herself on knowing Creole, what strangeness that country, quelle étrangeté ce pays, which produced qui ne produisait neither Mandingo, nor Fulani, nor Tukula, nor Sere, nor Wolof, nor Toma, nor Gerse, nor Fang, nor Fon, nor Bete, nor Eve, nor Dagbani, nor Yoruba, nor Mina, nor Ibo. And it was still blacks who lived there. <laughs> the young woman passes this by, noting only her pleasure at being complimented on her appearance. Are all the women of that country as pretty as Mademoiselle? I got a silly pleasure out of hearing this. Condé makes her overlook the list of languages. I cannot forget, as I remarked in the piece I wrote that, for Lidi, that a graduate student commented that the subaltern's remark is improbable because only an academically educated person would know such a comprehensive list of African languages. Here are the innocent transgressors on a taxonomy with the sustainable underdevelopers, the destroyers of the world. In nine days from now, we have a day-long discussion of how to confront the problem of the unsystematized languages of Africa and of the absence of language requirements in the development lobby. Two colleagues, a Rwandan Belgian from the University of Portsmouth, Olivia Rutazibwa, and an Iranian from SOAS, Mandana Seyfedinipur, will be joining us. And on Skype, we will have Abdul Rashid Nahalla, Vice Chancellor of uh, Kwara State University in Nigeria, and Hari Vasudevan, Indian, whose early experience in Kenya and special knowledge of subaltern multilinguality in India is a rare combination. Oluwaseun Akinfenwa, our Nigerian intern, will be there to learn and we will be speaking of the unsystematized uh, mother tongues of Africa and its need for the development lobby. I will think of this powerful moment in Erema Conon, a teaching text for the global, out of joint with today's careful benevolence toward the global south. 
1848, there was a legal emancipation of the enslaved in Guadeloupe. Through French ports in India, Indian indentured labor was brought over by the French. In 1861, they began to speak to the British and do the exchange. They came for the first time in 1854, packed in a ship called Aurélie. On the 150th anniversary, Maurice Condé arranged a conference called Expansion de l'âme. The title called upon the Afro-Caribbeans and the Indo-Caribbeans to come together as Guadeloupians. I'm not going to talk politically about pan-Caribbeanism, pan-Africanism, or anything. I'm speaking personally here. The title called upon the, uh, this is an unusual call, getting more unusual as the days go by in the other areas of the world where Indians and Africans come together. I'm recently coming from China, and as, the, as you know, the Chinese president is in town today, and the competition between China and India to establish new political and economic connections in Africa ignored these histories. I was the only Indian citizen among the people Maurice invited. I apologized. I sang a song by Tagore and explained line by line how neither he, our national poet, nor those of us who sang that lovely song and would sing it in the future had ever thought or would think of the fact that the poet's compatriots were providing slave labor upon such islands. I still remember how astonished they were to see an actual Indian passport. Because they were underclass, of course, they did not know anything about who their ancestors were and the way in which Indo-Caribbean creology had constructed a dream India. You can see how moved it made me because we had ignored these things. So I still remember how astonished they were to see an actual Indian passport mine. I cannot thank Maurice Conde enough for having given me this life-changing experience. I have left it to the specialists to comment on the great works, although I do wish I had a bit of time to speak on the uncompromising final work. I have spoken of the unique importance of her first work as a teaching text in our world of vanishing democracy. I have spoken of her intimate hope for an end to racism. In her own words, I quote, the world in which we live today is one of violence, terrorism, globalization. In that context, and again I quote, one must say farewell to the university before it is too late. I have spoken in that spirit, not as a professor, but as an activist who uses books and life for social justice. Thank you. Thank you uh, to all three, and thank you for um, all three of you talking about the title of this uh, journée. It's certainly the case that when we, when we talked about a title and thought about Maris Condé, a writer for our time or our times, uh, we were thinking both about Maris's relationship to history, to alternative histories, to the rereading of history, and to the relationship of uh, Maris Condé to this toxic present of self-conscious, regressive racism, sexism, classism. So that was very much on our mind. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, these these um, commentaries resonate very well with each other on many levels. Many things uh, came together. Uh, I don't know if the panelists would like to add anything or talk to each other at all or if anyone else in the room has a, a question or a comment uh, to raise. Maybe ask the panelists first. Um, I'll try to be quick in English first and then, and then if it needs to be done in French, I'll try my best. Um, I'm so moved. It's hard to explain, I'm not sure quite why, but I'm really profoundly moved. Um, in 1996, uh, a, a Japanese scholar or philosopher at Columbia University, Columbia University Teachers College in New York 
gave a uh, um, speech which has uh, grabbed my attention ever since, uh, talking, uh, asking what is, uh, the question is, what defines a true global citizen, the concept of global citizenship in the head? And there are three points that he suggests, and the one that I remember the most is he talked about the person who has creative empathy. And I just love that. And ever since, well, now, I've been in France since 2002. Um, one year ago, kind of by accident, I became the president of an association called Music Universel Arc-en-Ciel with the idea of the, of the Mandela's diversity, uh, the, 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 the rainbow being the, the diversity part, that we're all human beings before we are anything else. Um, and so we try to go with our, you know, um, concerts and conferences and things like that with the spirit to, to create bridges between different types of people. And uh, the last thing I wanted to, I mean, in case you have any reaction at all to this, I'm, it's probably not going to be a very clear question. Um, and the last thing would be uh, Fatumata Diawara. This is a Malian singer, composer, uh, I think she's also an actress who speaks about, as, as a young woman, well, she's probably in her 30s or something, her, how she sees her role as somebody from Mali, but who is also a global citizen. She doesn't use the word, but um, she has been working with uh, UNESCO and um, what's the guy's name, Herbie Hancock, uh, who created the Jazz Day concept in 20, 2012 and is celebrated the 30th of, of April every year. And it's kind of the same thing, intercultural dialogue and human dignity. And of course, the, if look at the, the, ja, the roots of jazz and everything he uses, that is like a educative uh, thing wherever he goes, because every year, uh, Jazz Day is celebrated in a different country, and then they use that three days to educate students and everybody else in that, in that area. Last, last year was St. Petersburg, this year it's, um, it's uh, Sydney in Australia. Anyway, I, I, I don't know how to pose this as a question, but in case you all have any, have any reaction to, oh, I can, I can put it this way. Fatou Diamara said, and I have to say this in French, in a, in a recent interview, je, elle, elle a dit quelque chose comme ça. Hein? Um, uh, L'Afrique n'a pas besoin d'une mère ou un père occidental. Euh, je, je me vois comme une génération qui, qui a besoin de personnes. Je veux porter l'Afrique sur mon dos. Et, et quand j'ai entendu ça, j'avais des chars de poule. I was, uh, in, in, in English, it would be, we, we don't need a Western mother or father. This young generation, we have the internet, we have uh, these things, we I'm go I'm sorry forward. To, I'm sorry to interrupt, but maybe then we should. I'm so like sorry. <laughs> okay, we, okay, so if there's any reaction to anybody, there, there you go. Reaction? Come on, you wanna go? Right? I, I, I can't stop talking once I start. That's why I always ask other people, okay, I'll try to be brief, which is a very difficult thing for me to be. Just stop me, okay? So the uh, global citizenship, first of all, I don't think a global citizenship is possible because there is no social contract in global governance. And so therefore, I mean, it's easily said by to me luggage, et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, here's the global citizen carrying to me luggage. I, because it, international civil society is self-selected moral entrepreneurs. You don't do citizenship in that way. So, and then I would also say that, you know, I'm coming from China, right? I actually was speaking there on the 23rd, three days ago. I'm the director of a trans-regional and trans-cultural uh, institute on the One Bell Pond Road at Yunnan Normal University. So I was speak honorary, of course, speaking as director. And uh, one of the students asked about cross-cultural exchange. And I, what I said was, cross-cultural exchange is impossible. 
I said, it is impossible. <laughs> you cannot learn cultures. You can only learn languages. And you will see, unless you enter the lingual memory, you can't do cross-cultural exchange with interpreters, which is why, although I can, je peux me débrouiller un peu en français, I'm not even pretending to speak in French. Because I'm an Anglophone person because of the history of imperialisms. So therefore, I would say that, the, and you said, what language would I like to speak in? I regularly give talks in Bengali. That's what I would like to speak in. And I, I confront the mechanical Marxists there. I vote in India. There are other languages. So at any rate, so therefore, I said it's impossible. And then I said, on the other hand, it is necessary. Therefore, just do it in as vulgar a way as possible. You know, smiling, making gestures, etc. Do it. But on the other hand, do not think you're doing it. Because in order for it to be, etc. And I gave my old example that many people have liked, that it is like knowing that we're going to die and yet getting up in the morning and brushing our teeth. It's like that, necessary but impossible. So that, that would be my reaction. But I would really like to speak for another two hours or so because <laughs> the, I can expand these, so therefore I give it over. Je pense que aussi que les citoyens globaux ou que la, le dialogue interculturel sont impossibles sont des pour moi des formules des formules pour masquer en fait les les impossibilités et le fait que en, euh, beaucoup de choses ne sont pas faites pour qu'il y ait un, de dialogue euh, je, si je pense aux universités si je pense à, à la à l'état dans lequel sont les universités, dans ce qu'on appelle le, le sud global, enfin dans ce qu'on appelle le tiers monde, je veux dire, là, c'est là que se passent les choses. C'est là qu'il faudrait agir. Euh, c'est justement dans l'enseignement des langues. Tout le reste me semble vraiment des, des mots de pacification, quoi. C'est-à-dire, c'est des, des mots un peu, enfin, c'est de la rhétorique. C'est voilà, c'est du spectacle, mais profondément, c'est la question que euh, les, des migrants meurent tous les jours euh, euh, dans la Méditerranée ou de partout euh, dans l'Europe, qu'il y a une politique des visas absolument terrible, que en France, là où nous sommes, les droits d'inscription des étudiants étrangers ont augmenté de telle manière qu'ils ne pourront plus venir faire des études. Donc le dialogue, pour la, je veux dire, il y a des, des, tout, des tas de choses concrètes euh, qui s'opposent au dialogue et qui s'opposent justement par, pour des raisons, par des choix. C'est pas... Euh, et, et donc ce, 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 ce discours du dialogue vient masquer le fait que se multiplient en fait des lois et des entraves à la circulation déjà des personnes qui voudraient tout simplement circuler, qui ne sont pas justement avec les « to me uh, luggage », mais qui sont avec les sacs en plastique et qui essayent de, juste de survivre. Donc pour moi, il, il, je veux dire, on ne peut pas parler de ça si on ne parle pas de ce qui se passe tous les jours aujourd'hui, euh, de, des lois anti-migrants qui se passent en Europe, de, la, de, 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 de tous ces... Euh, gouvernements qui, qui, qui sont en train de gagner en Europe et ailleurs et qui sont absolument, absolument contre, qui sont à, pour le libre marché, ça pour que les objets puissent circuler, la marchandise puisse circuler pour, les, pour la dépossession, mais surtout pas pour que justement il y ait une liberté de circulation et surtout pas pour que les gens se rencontrent. Et par contre, que les gens meurent tous les jours, oui. Je veux dire, ça c'est absolument visible tous les jours. There's another thing that needs to be said, which is that, you know, this um, saying that we don't need, uh, we don't need Western parents. One should also look at policy. You know, these remarks, are, who says this? These remarks are easily made when global policy goes another way. You don't, the policymakers do not listen to these remarks or celebrate them because that's very nice, because it keeps globalization alive when these things are said. You know, if you work, as indeed, you know, um, it is my great honor that I can join in Africa-led movements in Nigeria. And there, so it's not me that's leading anything, but there, if you actually, and this is also true in the places where I have schools in India among, among the landless illiterate, if you actually go into the savannas where when oil came, all of starch production stopped because there was no capital incentive and everything was coming from the United States, 
United States subsidized starch, right? And then slowly now, there are Nigerians who are trying to resuscitate the planting of rice in the savannas, right? And Lexi Cook, one of our, one of my uh, well, former students, she learned Yoruba so well that they actually chose her as one of these groups as an executive facing the other way. She knows many of these, uh, these unsystematized languages now. Now, when you go into those areas, they are not speaking uh, the lingua francas, and they some, and this is true also in India, the, the world's largest democracy. Some of the women do not know the name Nigeria. Okay, so unless you discount these people, the largest sector of the electorate who, with, with political campaigning in these languages just before the elections, lot of ethnic violence, destruction of democracy, whose body count democracy, they vote. They're made to vote. So therefore, unless you discount the largest sector of the electorate in the tri-continent, you cannot just say monolithically, Africans say, we do not need, prove it, we do not need the West. You know, think about talking about Mali, think about Mali mm -hmm. and French presence there. Mm -hmm. so, and so therefore, let's not idealize. If we want to work in there, we want to go and earn the right to join with those who are trying to change the situation and being screwed by Nigerians, by people like Dangote, whose name probably not too many uh, in this room knows. So therefore, I would just make this kind of respectful submission about who the African is who says this and that. Can I, can I say something, or are there more? I, it's hard for me not to respond uh, to something like that as a teacher. Um, because I think the politics of what we do, yes, some of us are activists and do work, activist work in the university and outside the university, but the activism of what we do is first of all in the classroom. So my first response is to think that yesterday, or I guess here it was last night, I was teaching a graduate seminar on one of my favorite essays of Gayatri's called Writing Wrongs in combination with a great novel uh, by Bessie Head called A Question of Power. And I think it's more useful, politically speaking, to think through the complexity of what Bessie Heads means in the first sentence mm. of that novel. Mm. Uh, as an African, just he anyone. said one of the most perfect things ever, I am just anyone. Yes. I'm just ordinary. As an African. That's not a claim to the status of global citizen. And he's not even a good guy in the novel. No, he's a... <laughs> <laughs> That's the work that we do as literary, as literary uh, scholars and as professors is try to allow a space for students to think that through. Um, in, in relation to Gayatri's essay, that particular piece is a talk that she gave to NGO folk, to the people who use labels like global citizen, um, and said, uh, tried to talk about the work she does in the tribal schools there. What I talked about with my students is what Gayatri means by a, a, a uh, category that she uh, thinks through in that essay, the new diasporics. Who are the new diasporics? My students were saying, if she wants to work in these rural schools in India, why doesn't she go and get teachers from all, there are lots of NGOs, why doesn't <laughs> she get them to come? <laughs> well. And I said, well, who does she mean by the new diasporics? And my students sitting around the table, the Brazilian guy who grew up in Sao Paulo, the Algerian woman, the Turkish guy, it took them about a half an hour to realize Oh, we're the new diasporics. That to me is political work, but it's not access to the category of, or to the banner of the global citizen. Uh, that, that's, I don't know that that's a fair response, but that's, that's where I am today. <laughs> I just, just have to say something about those NGOs, okay? I, in, the areas, in the areas where I have my five schools for 40 years now, I've never seen an NGO. It's below the NGO radar. But so suddenly, uh, two months ago, one of, my, one of my supervisors who has just been accused wrongly of two, uh, of two non bailable offenses and a lawyer is taking bribes and of course the only one who has money is 
me, but from New York, you can't send money to India. So my publishers in Naveen, publishers in India are sending money, but it's a, they're bribes, okay? Attempt, attempted murder, they've accused him of, and of uh, sexual harassment. They're non-bailable offenses. Anyway, that's not what it is. Anyway, they, he told me that an NGO had come, and one of the guy, boys in the local villages was working for the NGOs. So I said, good, good, when we train, I ask him to come. Because after all, he's teaching children. I don't care whether it's an NGO or my schools. He's teaching children, we will train. So he comes, he trains. And first, I'm talking to him in English because nobody knows English, right? So to see how he manipulates English, I can tell how he manipulates an unknown thing. So I'm speaking slowly, clearly in English, in Bengali accent, and he's answering as he can, okay. And so then I ask him in English, what is democracy? This village boy, and he says, he says, a, a literal translation of a Bengali word, but we need that word in English. He says, equalism, eh? shamavad. He translates shamavad, Bengali word, to this, into this English word, equalism. I use that word now. That's the word we need. So this kind of thing, global citizenship, where do you find, this guy doesn't know English. I was speaking to him in English simply to see, can he manage in, in this language which he supposedly learned? And he comes up with equalism. So I give you that word, I give you that word. I give you, Richard, native speaker of English. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> you know, that word, equalism, if you can use it. <laughs> Would anybody else like to ask a <laughs> question or make a, a comment, an intervention? Okay, then let's thank again Francoise Gayatri. <laughs>